What do you think of the term toxic masculinity? I'm afraid I think the term itself is toxic because it, uh, it it's quite a repellent term. By putting those two words together, it's impossible to ignore the conclusion implicit that there's something about masculinity itself that is toxic. And the evidence now is very strong that it, it certainly doesn't invite a conversation. Uh, it becomes something of a slur. And, and it's been broadened in its use. It actually used to have a pretty technical term in academia until 2016 for a very small group of people. Um, and it's now just essentially become a broad-based term for stuff boys and men are doing that you don't like. Um, and is, in the end, fatally, fatally undermined by the inability of most of those using it to define it, and in particular to define non-toxic masculinity in a way that is distinguishable from femininity. And so if there's no non-toxic masculinity, <laughs> then that you can define that's distinct, right? So it's distinctly masculine, but non-toxic, then uh, obviously the category is just imploded on itself, which is what I think has happened. And you said there was a, a technical academic way of describing it before. What, what was that origin? Yeah, so there were some sociologists and psychologists working with incarcerated male prisoners for uh, their men who'd been incarcerated for very, very violent crimes. Um, and they were, they were working with them on some of the ways in which their ideas of masculinity had become intertwined with particular acts of violence. And so it was the connection between, in a sense, kind of really hyper violence and what that meant about masculinity. And there were certain groups, a subgroup of that subgroup, if you like, for whom that term was applied. And so it was, it was a, a term that was used in very obscure academic journals a, a few times a year until 2016. And then suddenly it was on the front page of, of everywhere. It just became, because of Donald Trump, because of Me Too, lots of, lots of things uh, contributed to it. Um, but it sort of broke out of the margins of academia and became uh, a general term. But most of the uh, thoughtful feminist writers that I engage with anyway have, have really, even if they didn't always think this, they've now come to see the term as unhelpful, uh, not only in terms of helping men, but actually uh, in, in terms of helping feminism. It, it doesn't it doesn't entice men to be better feminists to talk about toxic masculinity. Yeah, it's interesting that you um, you notice this this root in academia too. I was I was on a university campus recently, and I I just overheard a a, a young man and a young woman, and I, I think he was kind of flirting with her, and then it it turned into a discussion about was his flirting toxic or post toxic masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Post-toxic masculinity is a new one on me. Yes, it seems to be evolving. Interesting. Well, I wonder if that's... Um, I mean, there is something to this idea that like, the same apparent behavior could be toxic or not toxic, if we just use that language for a moment, um, depending on the context, depending on the uh, sometimes unspoken cues, etc. So flirting, right? Um, let's leave aside let's leave aside the idea of toxic masculinity and just say like is that you know are you engaging with a woman in a way that is like appropriate and respectful and helpful you know positive is it positive let's see maybe use positive rather than negative well it depends it depends whether you've got any permission to do it whether she's signaled she's interested in it whether there's body language that suggests that it's okay the way you're doing it the your body language right? there's a whole bunch of stuff going on which is impossible to capture in words but everyone knows in real life that the same action can be very different. Like someone putting their hand, someone putting their arm around you, right? That's a single action that can mean a thousand different things depending on the context. And it could actually be a creepy, negative, yucky, quotes, toxic thing, or it could be a lovely, wonderful, welcome, just what I needed thing. And yeah. part of the art of being human is to figure out which moments you're in. Richard, for, for you to take on uh, this topic, it seems that there's um, just a, a stigma around talking about issues of boys and men. What was it like for you to to move into this topic? Well, I also think that the the dangers of some of these topics are perhaps overstated. Uh, I'll be honest and say that I was nervous about how my forays into this would be received, how the book would be received. And it turns out that I think largely my fears were misplaced for reasons we can perhaps get into. Um, by and large, I found the response to be you know, positive, re respectful even when, it dis when, it's, when there's disagreement across the political spectrum. So I haven't been you know, dismissed in a way that perhaps uh, I thought was at least possible, uh, especially in the current political landscape.
Um, and, I, and as I said, I think that's for a bunch of reasons. But by and large, I, it's gone pretty well. Um, so, of course, it's, you know, I shouldn't say that. Uh, who knows what will happen next? And there is always this, you know, there is this kind of slight sense that on the one hand, you can say you're, you're treading on eggshells. I might say something right now to you. Right, that just becomes the 10 second clip that you know does for you. But generally speaking, most people aren't paying as much attention to us as we think. Um, and most people are more gracious than the, the 1% on Twitter who, who aren't. And actually, whenever I, uh, this will be, I, I'm about to say something that will sound very masculine, but um, whenever I think about, is this a brave thing to do or not? I, the image I conjure is of my great grandfather who I have a picture of uh, most of the time next to me, uh, who fought in World War One and was quite badly wounded in the Battle of the Somme in 1917. And I have pictures of him after that battle. Tide Bess was his name, Welsh, my Welsh great-grandfather. Um, uh, and I just imagine a conversation where I try to explain to my great-grandfather as he uh, comes off the battlefields of the Somme wounded, how brave I'm being by writing a book about boys and men and risking the occasional nasty tweet and trying to imagine <laughs> what his response would be. And I find that very grounding. <laughs> <laughs> That's an incredible meditation. <laughs> Richard, you said that there, um, there were maybe some, some things to explore about what you expected and how that's, that's actually played out. Um, what, what was that? Yeah, so I, I think th there's a sense, and, and very thoughtful colleagues uh, said, You'll, you'll be just panned or dismissed or attacked on the left and embraced on the right. Uh, this is a huge risk. Uh, not, you know, but not sure why you're doing it. I mean, people who, whose opinions I'd really respected. Uh, and I took that as a challenge to try and approach the subject in a way that made that much less likely to happen and to increase my chance of that not happening. So for sure, it was useful to have those warnings. But generally speaking, that hasn't happened. And I think that's for a number of reasons. I think, number one, it's because... I come at this as a Brooking scholar with, if you know, to the extent that I have any kind of political aura around me, it's probably sort of center left, right? That's what people think. I'm actually politically quite homeless, um, but I've done a lot of work on inequality. I've done a lot of work on racial justice. So, you know, I'm, I'm clearly not someone you can, you can say, oh, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a conservative. Um, and so that's number one. Number two, Brookings. All right. It's a Brookings Institution Press book. It's a um, a Brookings scholar, and it's written in quite a Brookingsy way. All right. Um, it's quite fact forward. It's quite analytical. I hope it's balanced. I hope it doesn't feel partisan. And it's quite solutions oriented. It's, it's like, okay, we know there's a bunch of stuff going on. Here's a bunch of policies. Here's a bunch of suggestions. Here's a bunch of things we can do about it. Let's let's get past the stage of the debate, which has basically been the secular equivalent of the Book of Lamentations. Like, we know there's a lot of stuff going on here. I wanted that. So I think for all those reasons, that's actually meant that there was a more receptive audience. I also think that, that there's been enough evidence for long enough now for some of these problems for them to become harder to ignore. You know, it's just they've been festering for quite a long time now. And maybe metastasizing in unhelpful ways in our political life, that helps to get people's attention. Uh, but finally, I think most importantly, there's just a bunch of people who really do want to talk about this. They just need a permission space in which to do it. And I hope and think that the book has helped to create an environment within which these conversations can be had in good faith. Uh, certainly that's how I've approached them. And so, so far, my interlocutors, even those that strongly disagreed with me, have done so in good faith. Uh, and, I, and, and my sense is there's been a huge appetite for that, which is, can we have this conversation without, you know, name calling or presumptions or, or, or thinking that by caring about boys and men, it means you have to stop caring about women and girls or you hate women or you hate feminism or you hate modernity or, or you've got an axe to grind or you are rejected by girls at school or you're an incel or you know, whatever. Uh, I mean, if you could just take all that stuff off the table and just say, no, we're just having a conversation, um, that helps. One of the... One of the nicest things that was written about the book was by Matthew Iglesias, who wrote a long review, and he said the book is earnest, at times bordering on banal. I may be slightly paraphrasing it, but that's not <laughs> going to go on the front cover of the paperback for sure. My publisher wasn't thrilled by earnest bordering on banal, but I was, because whilst I, whilst I hope the book's accessible and interesting to people and that they all, everyone watching or listening to this immediately goes out and buys 10 copies for themselves and all their friends, it is quite a wonky book. Right? It is like, that's the point. It's quite analytical. It's, it's, and, and actually, there's enough polemics in this space. 
Um, I didn't need another polemic. What I, what I wanted to do is something that was a bit more analytical, a bit, a bit cooler. And to use Matthew's word, earnest. Yeah, I'll take earnest. Well, let's get into some of those wonky details. What are you noticing with boys in education? That in every advanced economy, uh, including the US, the boys are behind in relative terms girls at every stage of the education system and in every essentially every subject and that that gap has been growing over the last two or three decades um, such that we're now at the point where the gender gap in higher education in the US is wider today than it was in 1972 when title nine was passed it's just the other way around so in 1972 men were about 13 percentage points more likely to get a four-year degree than women now women are 15 percentage points more likely to get a college degree than men and so it's a, it's a slightly bigger gap but just completely reversed so just as a as a, a way to really i think uh, dramatize the point saying that we have more gender equality on college in college today than we did in 72 when title nine was passed just the other way around it helps to kind of a helps to draw attention to the fact that there's a big gap there and it's 60 40 now female male on college campuses in the u.s and many it's much higher but that all that really just reflects on what's going on kind of all the way back down through the education system so for for those getting the highest gpas in high school two-thirds of them are girls for those getting the lowest gpas two-thirds of them are boys boys three or four times more likely to um pieces for being expelled from school um there are gaps at the age five everywhere and in the uh, I'll, I'll give one more sort of data point uh, on education um, is that in the typical school district in the US now, so you take the median school district, girls are about three quarters of a grade ahead in English, so almost a grade ahead in English, and are, are dead even in math. In poorer school districts, they're a grade ahead in English and are about a third of a grade ahead in math. So in the poorest parts of the US, um, the girls are just ahead in everything. And, and it's an important point that maybe we'll get to, but that all of these gender inequalities we're talking about, they're really most salient for working class boys and men and boys and men of color. And that the further you go down the socioeconomic scale, the wider the gaps get. So the really, the, the very widest gender gaps are in our poorest families and our poorest neighborhoods. Well, let's get into why that is. I've, I've heard you say that maybe the through line of your work is the extent to which birth is destiny. So this seems a mix of factors of birth, what, what race you're born, what gender you're born, what socioeconomic status you're born. What are you seeing? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good, nice way into it. And thank you for, thank you for picking up that line of my, of my thinking. It probably stems from my million John Stuart Mill liberalism. Um, and so what it means to me is that if I see these kinds of gaps, I'm, I'm looking for structural explanations. I'm not, uh, and it's again, it's another big theme of my book, is not to go to individual explanations. It's not that individuals don't count, that individual responsibility doesn't matter, but when you see these patterns so so repeated, then you have to suggest there's something structural going on. And what I see is that in, particularly in kind of less, in poorer neighborhoods, and in many of our schools, and in the education system in general, there are just structural disadvantages for boys and men. Um, and those then play out into the results we've just seen. And so what that means is that to be male puts you at a disadvantage in some quite important ways in some of the systems and environments and structures within which people find themselves and that that therefore disadvantages them. So that, that, that's the through line, which is like, we didn't choose what sex we were gonna be born. And in just the same way that we need to make sure that there aren't things about being, being a, a girl or a woman that inhibit your opportunities to go and do something. We should also pay this. We should pay similar attention to boys and men. The reason that's hard is because for at least the last 10,000 years, it has mostly been about focusing on women and girls. And so all of a sudden, almost overnight, we're like, wait, 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 you want to talk about boys and men now? And, and I'm saying, yeah, because that's, the, that's the data. Um, but it's happened so fast that it's really hard for people's mindset to catch up with the reality that they're now struck. The idea, very idea that the education system is structured against boys is really hard to even say, let alone even to get your head around. But it also seems to me to be pretty hard to deny given given the results that we're seeing. Unless there's some, unless boys are genuinely intrinsically stupider or weaker or lazier than girls, and I don't incline to that view. What's the explanation for why they're falling so far behind in education if it's not the structure of the education system. And so what is it about the education system that, that leaves boys further behind? 
the first problem with it is that it presumes the chronological age uh, is a good proxy for developmental age in the same way for boys and girls. So obviously how old you are is a crude proxy anyway, right? So we just say, oh, you're five, you're ready for school. You're, you know, you're 18, you're ready for college. You're 14, you're ready for high school. This is completely arbitrary. Um, and, but, you know, they're, so they're very, very crude proxies. Um, but we have to use something to decide how to kind of organize our education system. The problem is that it's uh, that it proxies development differently for girls and boys. Uh, it does so at every age, but it particularly does in adolescence. So the, in fi at 15 or 16, girls are about a year ahead in terms of their brain development, and in particular in terms of the development of the prefrontal cortex, which is, it's um, there are lots of technical ways to describe the prefrontal cortex. I like to describe it as the, the bit of your brain that turns your chemistry homework in. Um, it's the bit of your brain that remembers you've got chemistry homework that takes the chemistry homework home that does the chemistry homework that takes the chemistry homework to school and that turns in the chemistry homework to the chemistry class and that knows that you have a chemistry class <laughs> at night at eight in the morning. And so that's the prefrontal cortex doing all that work for you. It's the CEO of the brain. It's the these are not cognitive skills. It's not about smarts. It's about act togetherness, future orientation, organizational skill deferring gratification, impulse control. And that stuff's just stronger in girls than boys anyway, but it develops earlier in girls. And the education system rewards those skills quite strongly. So it's interesting that like, I've mentioned the GPA gaps, a big gap in GPA. There's no gap really in most of the standardized tests. So SAT, ACT, there's no gender gap. Um, and so what that tells you is, and those are pretty good measures of cognitive ability or smarts, if you like, but GPA really rewards these other skills turning your homework in, turning up for class, uh, et cetera. And so what that tells us is that that bit of the brain um, is being rewarded by the education system and just develops much earlier in girls than boys. And it turns out that the biggest gap is probably the most important point in the educational journey, which is the middle of high school, when your grades actually matter. Um, and when studying for your SAT matters, when thinking about which college you're going to matters. And so it's just, it's obviously not by design, um, but by accident that, it's, that the education system is structured in a way that age, in that age, uh, the age, the age development proxy is different for boys and girls. That, that one's especially interesting because as I understand it, the um, college admissions process has become much more GPA oriented and much less yes. SAT oriented as well, correct? Correct, which everything else equal can only put boys at a further disadvantage. Wow, wow. Um, because as I said, there isn't much of a gender gap in, there's a slight, I think girls are a bit more likely to take the SAT, but um, but basically the standardized tests are, they're, they're equal. Mm -hmm. So there's no advantage for boys in those tests over girls, but nor the other way around, but there's a big advantage for girls over boys in GPA. Um, so as I've said, if you take the top 10% of GPA earners, two thirds of them are girls. So particularly in terms of like particularly in terms of selective college admissions, right? If you're selecting from the top 10, 20 percent by GPA, well, two thirds of them are girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we, so the fact that our campuses are now 60 percent female shouldn't be a surprise if we're increasingly admitting on the basis of GPA. So leaving aside the, the problem with this debate, though, Brendan, is that GPA is a really good predictor of how you're going to do in college. It's a much better predictor than SAT or ACT because it turns out the skills that give you a good GPA are also the skills you need to do well in college. Mm -hmm. Study skills, habits, impulse control, etc. And the boys still behind girls even on college campuses. So from a college point of view, it's not crazy to use GPA because it's a better predictor. That said, both together are even better predictors. Um, um, but in terms of in terms of predicting future success, it turns you know, the GPA is a good measure. Um, but it but no no doubt it will it will accelerate the gender gap. And then the other two, I was going to say two other things as well, and just say one sentence on each. One is not enough male teachers and fewer over time. And the second thing is a shift away from vocational kinds of learning or applied learning styles. On e on average, those things are going to disadvantage boys. Mm -hmm. What is that about fewer teachers? And how does that uh, how does that play in fewer male teachers? So. Um, so there are fewer male teachers over time. Today, 24% of K-12 teachers are male. That's down from 33% in the 80s. So it's, it's a, a, a steady decline, but a decline. Um, and actually, the, uh, and you can see in applicants to teach training colleges that that decline is going to continue as you look at the pipeline. Well, only one in 10 elementary school teachers are male. And there's some pretty good evidence that male teachers help boys do better in school. And in particular, the evidence is that in subjects like English, 
male teachers help. This is something I've really learned since I finished the book. Um, that uh, I've learned since I finished the book that the English is the subject that men are least likely to be teaching in school. So it's not only that there are very few men, but of, but of those men, the subject they're least likely to teach is English, and the evidence is strongest for the influence of male teachers in English. <laughs> so there's a kind of dub, there's a sort of dub, it kind of gets worse and worse the closer you look. Uh, and in the same way, by the way, female teachers in STEM subjects have historically been good for girls. Um, what, but neutral for boys and the same the other way around it, for, it doesn't seem to matter to girls if their English teacher is male or female but it does seem to matter to boys and that makes sense these are, these are subjects where you're at a bit of a disadvantage anyway you're going against the grain somewhat by gender and so to have a teacher in that subject um, my, own, my own English high school English teacher was a male Korean war veteran actually mm. uh, and I, you know, I, I've no doubt that it was helpful to have a, a male teacher when it comes to teaching the poetry the love poetry of john dunn to a bunch of 16 year old working class boys in peterborough i i think it helped that he was a guy um and it may well be one of the reasons why i ended up doing a lot of writing and making a career out of writing because mr wyatt um taught me john dunn uh i don't know that's an end of an end of one um but just generally we can see that the ethos of schools and that the performance of boys uh, is a bit better when there are more male teachers around and and, and it's it's really striking to me the this trend is continuing towards the gradual the gradual feminization of the teaching profession and what's really striking is that nobody seems to know or care mm -hmm. uh, and and it seems to me like we should at least know that um, and, and have a conversation about whether it matters the kind of presumption that it doesn't matter is one that I would challenge empirically but I may be wrong about that maybe maybe it doesn't matter if one day all of our teachers are women but I gotta tell you, I don't think many people would agree with that statement. And so mm -hmm. what's an okay amount? We're heading towards 80%. Uh, we have no early years teachers, almost no early years teachers are male. Very few, you know, most of our elementary schools don't have a male teacher. Like, like at what point do we ring an alarm bell? At mm -hmm. what point do we start to do something about this trend? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I'm you know, really quite passionate about is saying, well, at the very least, let's ring the alarm bell and say, is everyone cool with teaching becoming a female profession? Mm -hmm. Okay, if so, okay. But it feels like we should have that conversation. Yes, and the, the numbers on the early years male teachers, I've heard you compare it to women fighter pilots. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's the journalist in me coming out. But, um, but yeah, so only 3%, between 2 and 3% of early years educators are male. And uh, uh, with your background uh, in the Air Force, you, you'll be interested to, to uh, by this comparison, about 7% of fighter pilots, um, uh, I, sorry, military pilots are women. About 12% of navigators um, are women. Um, so what that means is that we have twice as many women flying US military planes as we do men teaching kindergarten as a share of the professions, of course. And actually, more women as navigators back seat in the back seat of the, of the plane than men teaching elementary school. Uh, so, like, we've we've feminized the the U.S. Air Force much more successfully than we've masculinized early years in elementary education. Yeah, and it, it seems too that um, there isn't an, an effort to bring men into um, these early years education professions, whereas there's a there's a very clear effort to bring women into military aviation. Just as an aside, my, my friend Erica, she was uh, a very talented um, navigator, weapon systems officer. And um, when it came time for her to be selected to be in a, a strike fighter aircraft, which is, that's the premiere, that's kind of the dream job. Mm. Um, it turned out that she was too small for the physics of the ejection seat. And so what they did was they paid her to continue to live in Pensacola, Florida and to gain weight until she could reach the threshold where she was heavy enough to fly in an ejection seat because it was that important to get her along. Wow. And it, it took probably six months. Wow. Did she end up being overweight, though? <laughs> uh, she like, she, yeah, she, she was small to, to begin with. Her, they have to fatten her up. So that she, well, it's, it's a great story. And I, was, I actually it was one of these rabbit holes you go down when you're researching a book. I went down the rabbit hole of the redesign of ejector seats mm -hmm. and cockpits. Mm -hmm. Um, that's going on to become much more inclusive um, so that you're not designing out you know, so much of the population. And it includes men of different heights and weights too, of course. So yes. in that sense, it'll bring more men in. But also a big part of the push is like if you, if you set the standards of weight and height you know, 
a certain uh, too high then you just you exclude like almost all women or whatever so it was designed they were designed around men of a certain height and weight so they're redesigning planes and seats so they don't have to do what your friend erica had to do um or at least less but you're right the effort that goes into it is is huge what's the equivalent effort that's going into how do we get more guys into teacher training colleges or indeed into nursing or indeed into other fields? Like I call them the heel professions, health, education, administration, and literacy. Well, there's huge labor shortages, very few men. Um, how do we make them more appropriate for and attractive to men? How do we redesign our training systems to make them a to accommodate men more or indeed our education system to serve boys better in the same way that we're redesigning airplanes <laughs> to fit women more which mm -hmm. i applaud which i applaud i think that's great but i just I, I just i don't see enough action on the other side of the equation mm -hmm. and richard another factor that you mentioned is a, a lack of uh, vocational training i think a lot of folks who listen to this show will be interested because it, vocational training has really been held up as a great model to build skills and a lot of people who listen to the show are interested in, in building skills mastering skills um, what is changing with that model of education? Well, over the last few decades, there's been less investment in CTE, career and technical education. Uh, there's been something of a revival in more recent years. There's been a, a growing recognition that, that was a bad move to back away from CTE uh, and more generally in more vocational training. The driver, but it's important, I think, to acknowledge that one of the reasons behind the retreat was the evidence that it was that it was being used to track, particularly based on race. And what you were finding was that uh, it was disproportionately boys of color, boys and girls of color, actually being tracked into these vocational tracks. So it's like, well, you're not college material, so let's help you learn to do something with your hands. Um, and I, I get that concern. Uh, and it was appropriate to look at like how is this playing out in practice but it, but I fear that the the reaction to that has now gone way too far such that it seemed like almost that kind of track we, we don't even think about that until we finish high school by which time it's got very often too late so very few technical high schools one of the things I argue for is doubling the number of technical high schools in the US currently only about seven percent of students go to one which are very good for boys and then a huge increase in the number of apprenticeships, which again, there's a bill that's been sitting in the Senate for at least the last year to create a million new apprenticeships, it hasn't moved. Um, the US is like bottom of the international league table when it comes to the share of apprenticeships for, for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons, honestly, is because it's almost all men, it's 90% male um, apprenticeships. And so there's this sense of like, why would we wanna spend on this thing that's gonna help men? To which I would say, well, I think see that right now as a feature, not a bug because the mainstream education system is not one where a lot of boys and men are flourishing. And so if there's alternative pathways, great. And if they turn, they turn out to suit boys and men on average a bit better than girls and women, great. Because college campuses on average are, are suiting women and women a bit better than men. And we're not gonna get to fit back to 50-50, I think, in college. You have to accept the fact there are just some built-in advantages for women. Um, in mainstream education. So I think we, we, we shouldn't be blind to the fact, we shouldn't be relaxed about it, the gap growing, but I also think we have to kind of recognize that to some extent, it would take an extraordinary effort now to get back to 50-50. I just, I just like to see the trend lines going the other way. Um, but in the meantime, like if, if apprenticeships and vocational training and technical high schools are good for boys and men, great. Uh, let's do more of that. I think so there's a slight reluctance precisely because they are good for boys and men um, <laughs> to actually invest in them, which is, uh, in my, in my, and I understand why politically, but it's uh, counterproductive. Maybe we can break that down a little bit. That seems to be a, a zero sum argument around this topic, that if it's, if it's good for boys, then it shouldn't be invested in um, because we, we need to keep taking care of girls. Um, how do you navigate that, that zero sum sort of attitude when you're looking at policy and, and these questions? So I think there's a couple of different levels to think about this on it. One is that the, the general the general proposition that the flourishing of the two sexes, two genders is a zero sum game is, is nonsense. Um, and so just that cultural level, right? There, there either has to be a war on women led by men so that men can get all the goodies or there has to be a you know, war on boys and war on men led by the feminists because they want to get all the goodies. And, and essentially it's just like it's zero sum. So we're all fighting over the same turf. It's like a World War One back to back to my uh, great grandfather. But it's like a World War One model of, of politics. Give them an inch. They'll take a mile. Let's dig in. 
uh, and just you know try and take as many you know try and inflict as many casualties as possible on the other side without giving any ground. And I think that's just wrong culturally. It's certainly wrong in the labour market. It's the reason men are struggling in the labour market is not because women are doing well in the labour market. It's for other reasons. Um, but at another level, I I I suppose it, you know, it's important to be honest about the fact that like if you're spending money on something. Uh, and, and you face financial constraints, then you could argue that that money could go to something else that supports women and girls. So let's say we did spend one and a half billion on apprenticeships, or we spent like five billion on creating my extra 1,000 technical high schools. Um, would that take away from other priorities? Like money doesn't grow on trees. Okay, sure. But would it necessarily take away from the ongoing efforts for women in STEM or scholarships for women in STEM? No, that's not necessarily where the money has to come from. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be zero sum in that sense. Uh, and I will point out, just as a kind of data point, that the five, the five billion I mentioned to create a thousand new technical high schools, which would double the number of kids in technical high schools in the US to about 15%, is about 1% of the cost of abolishing student debt. Uh, uh, so leave aside arguments about getting rid of student debt. Right? That's 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 pretty good value. I got to tell you, a thousand a thousand technical high schools for the price of one percent of the cost of wiping out student debt, that's worth it. Uh, and interestingly, of course, I have I have reasons to be skeptical about uh, cancelling student debt, which are unrelated to the gender distribution of beneficiaries. But it is noteworthy that two thirds of college debt is um, is held by women. Um, and that that's why college debt has been described by the administration as a gender justice issue, because two, uh, two thirds, because as I said, two thirds of the benefit, two thirds of the debt cancellation would would be to the benefit of women. Now, that's not, that's not a, certainly not a reason to be against it, and it's a reason for many people to be in favour of it. But there, you've got a extraordinarily expensive policy, which is, will have very very strongly gendered effects. Um, and so it may well be that if like technical high schools typically, you know, for one percent of the cost turn out to help boys a bit more, I can live with that. And Richard, I've also heard you talk about um, addressing this maybe right at the beginning of the education system with a, a red shirting policy. Um, what do you think about that um, as far as um, the power of, of something like that? So it comes back to the conversation we had earlier about this developmental difference between boys and girls. And so uh, the fact that boys just develops, you know, they do, they lag behind girls in terms of brain development. Uh, it's it's interesting the whole debate about male and female brains uh, misses that the biggest difference is not in what uh, develops but when like it's the difference in timing of brain development and there there is no controversy at all like there's no nobody does who studies any of this stuff doesn't know there isn't a big difference in when it's just that we ignore it when it comes to education policy so if there's this big developmental gap my proposal is to just by default start boys in school a year later than girls in terms of their chronological age so if girls start at five start boys at six which would level the playing field somewhat in terms of development uh, you know a, a 15 year old girl is on average about the same as a 16 year old boy in terms of the development of these critical parts of their brain and so why not and so red shirting is the term borrowed from athletics for that which is to just delay entry and so my proposal is to just by default delay entry um, for boys for a year now of course some parents might not want to do that and they'll they, they won't some parents might want to do it with their girls um, and they should be free to do that as they are now um, but as a matter of public policy I think it would be useful to just stagger the entries somewhat because otherwise the neurological differences between girls and boys is just always going to put boys at a disadvantage in the education system. So I think we should recognize that in the school start, the school starting age. I'm curious of, of what you think of a, a similar program. So um, two of my lifelong friends, uh, both as, as little boys, had trouble in kindergarten and one was held back, essentially repeated kindergarten. The other, there happened to be a unique timing in our city where there was a transitional first grade program is what they called it. So they got the sense of advancing, but it was still kind of outside of the system. And then they were going to come back into a regular first grade later. And that class was mostly boys, that transitional mm -hmm. first grade class, mostly boys. Um, but for, for both of my friends, this was probably the right move. And um, I wonder what you think of, of maybe like a transitional first grade option to sort of off ramp boys for a while and back in. Where was this? This was in Maine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Massachusetts has a similar um, policy um, and some school districts 
mm -hmm. uh, have, have done similar things too. There's various names for it. And interesting, a lot of private schools do it too. Oh. They have like an extra pre-K year or pre plus, pre minus one or whatever. It's quite common. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Quaker schools have it, mm -hmm. um, which is super interesting. And again, as far as I'm able to get the data, it, it does look like it's predominantly male. So um, it, it's a way, I think, to get at the same, the same problem. My, uh, so I'd, I'd certainly support it. My question will be twofold. Number one is, what social impact does it have? Uh, does it in any way uh, make it harder to develop friendships socially? Does it, is it stigmatized, et cetera? Probably not if it's early enough. Probably not if it's branded well enough. I think it's very different to hold someone back in ninth grade in oh, terms yeah. of what impact that has on their social, and, and, I'm, and that's partly what I'm trying to avoid. Um, but I guess if you're doing it kind of early enough and it's framed in the right way, yeah, it's probably messy enough. We're young enough not to really know what's going on, which is part of the reason why I think my red shirting proposal would work. Because no, 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 no one really knows. Like, who knows how old they are when they're four or five? It's just a mess. So it's, that would be one question. And the other thing is, um, I'm worried about the developmental gap in adolescence, and I, and it's not clear how much we'd be able to predict that from what the gap is in the early years. And so even if like you're not, you know, you're not struggling at five, you might be struggling at fifteen. Um, again, a lot of that is to do with when you hit puberty or kinds of, you know, the pace of development, all kinds of stuff is going on there. That's the main reason girls' prefrontal cortex develops earlier is because they hit puberty earlier, by the way. Hitting puberty triggers the development of the prefrontal cortex, the extra development of it. So, um, yeah, and I think realistically, uh, those sorts of programs um, may well be more, more tractable than a blanket red shirting proposal. Um, and in practice, it will end up having a similar effect because if it's mostly boys, then you know you're kind of doing a kind of redshirt the boys proposal just in a different different way, but with the same the same result that they're a year older when they get down the line. To the idea of redshirting and the, and the metaphor, so I was a I was an NCAA athlete, and I can remember being 18 and going to college, and then all of a sudden competing against men who were 23, 24 years old. Um, I wonder if you do this with boys in schools. I wonder what it's like when they're in high school and there's a 19, 20 year old man in high school where there are also 14 year old kids. And what do you think of that? Yeah, well, I come at this with, the, you know, I'm British. And so our secondary education starts at 11. So I, you know, I went to school, I just turned 11 and there were 18 year old, 19 year old men. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so I, which I, well, which was an interesting experience, especially it was quite a tough school. But, um, so I guess it's harder for me to immediately see it as a problem given my, my mm -hmm. background. So I'm just confessing that I come at it with that prior, but look at, I mean, that's happening already. Um, one in four black boys repeat a grade before they finish high school. Wow. Right. So it's not as if there aren't a number of kids who are older anyway, uh, some or at least one grade, you know, and some proportion more than one grade. Um, uh, and that will be true for a lot of low income white boys as well. It's just that the numbers are easier to get nationally um, for black boys. So um, to some extent, that's happening anyway. I don't know if that's necessarily a terrible thing. I mean, and when I was looking at this, um, looking looking into some people saying, well, what will it be like? What will it be like for the boys? Uh, as far as sports concerned, I don't know. Right? Mm -hmm. It might just mean that it might be tougher as a freshman. Um, but don't forget if everyone did it and you were doing, you were playing and it's within sex and everyone would be a year older. Right. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have 14 year olds starting high school They'd, all, as boys. The girls would start at four. All mm -hmm. the boys would be 50. Right. So they're mm -hmm. all a year older anyway. So the comparative, so the difference, the difference shouldn't actually get any greater. Everyone will just shift it a year, a year later. But in terms of the social environment, one of the things that people are concerned about is what it'd be like for girls. You know, do do we really want you know, nineteen-year-old men around the girls? Well, actually, um, girls in tenth grade are twice as likely to be dating a guy from a higher grade as from their own grade. So to the extent that we reveal, we reveal, think revealed preference is a thing, it turns out that the girls, certainly romantically, but maybe socially too, are seeking out the company of older of the older boys. That makes perfect sense if once you know there's a developmental gap. It also makes perfect sense, by the way, if you spend any time at all with young with young men or women, with <laughs> adolescent teenagers, or you've been an adolescent teenager, you know, if you've been a teenager, um, none of these things are like so I'm saying it in a very social sciencey way, but whenever I go and talk to schools about this idea, they're like, well, duh, 
<laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> like, so quite a lot of this stuff is just fancy charts and fancy words and numbers for what everyone else is saying. Well, duh, tell me something I don't know. Right. Uh, the school system also kind of functions as a way of um, almost daycare for children of working parents. It gets them out of the house. It has them to go to a predictable place. If we delay that a year, um, what could be the, the ramifications of that or, or what could be ways to maybe temper that challenge? Yeah, so I mean, I think it partly depends. It's a great question. Uh, universal pre-K, childcare support generally. I'm, I think the str- probably the strongest social welfare argument against my proposal is that is that one is that particularly for lower income families, they're they're, they're waiting for the day that you know they don't have to pay for childcare anymore or their kid, the youngest kid gets off to school. So by delaying that a year, you're delaying that moment. And so it would have to be accompanied by childcare subsidies, uh, pre-K. I talk basically talk about a double dose of pre-K for boys. So they go into pre-K at the same age, but they just don't, a bit like what you were just discussing with your friends, you just, they just do it twice. Um, so it need to be all kinds of support so that it didn't economically impact the fat, particularly low income families. I'm not so worried about affluent, more affluent families, um, but lower income ones. And of course they can opt out. They don't have to do what I'm suggesting. Um, and a couple of places, including New York City, have actually for, forbade it. They've made it, uh, you're not allowed to red shirt your kids because it was the more affluent parents doing it. So they've actually forbidden them from doing it. Uh, so some of them are now going private, of course. Uh, so yes, although interestingly, um, uh, there are countries where people start a little bit earlier. So one of the proposals that was made to me by one of my correspondents was, oh, I think you should start girls a year earlier because hmm. they're ready. Um, you know, uh, why, I, I get it. I get the staggering, but actually you could start boys the same age as they start now. Just put the girls in a year earlier. Because they're starting to kick, they're start, they're they're ready, they're ready to go earlier. You're kind of holding the girls back. It's a different way to think. They're, they're they're ready to go into school when you're kind of delaying it because the boys aren't ready. So why not just change it? So you could get the same staggering effect at different ages. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean you delay the boys. You could accelerate the girls. Richard, um, what about uh, boys' schools? It seems that I've seen maybe more private schools for women, um, but I haven't seen much of boys' schools. I wonder what happens in boys' schools. Is that effective? Are you talking about K-12 or uh, higher education or both? Well, both. But I'm, I, I would say that I, I definitely see plenty of women's colleges. I don't notice many men's only colleges. I, I feel like that would be taboo. I think a lot of schools that used to be men's colleges have been um, become co-ed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but what do you see? Maybe let's start with the younger ones. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right about colleges there. The men's ones have pretty much all gone now. Um, but the women's ones have remained. Not all of them, but there are many more have remained. Um, so it's, it's one of the things I really looked at because a lot of people said, look, you've got to look at single sex education. If boys and girls develop at different ages, if they learn in different ways, again, all on average, then why not single sex? And so I looked, I looked at that and I just didn't see that. I didn't see that much evidence that it was having big effects. Uh, for, for either boys or girls, actually. Um, there is some evidence out there, but not much from the US. It's very hard to do good studies on this because inevitably the sorts of people choosing to send their kids to single sex schools are not random. They're not randomly drawn from the population. So it's incredibly hard to get a control, any kind of sensible control group. It's a huge selection effect here. Um, but but the, the good studies I, I looked at that tried to look at it just went, meh, there's not much to see here. And so as I'm not against it. And it's there's still an outstanding question of whether for, for black boys in particular, there may be some specific advantages because of this kind of intersection of race and gender that they are facing. So we just don't know. There isn't, there isn't good enough evidence on that. And certainly there's no evidence that it's harmful. So uh, I think my position on this is I'm not against it. Um, and I think parents may well choose to do it. But we shouldn't reorganize the entire public education system along single sex lines. So the okay. people who think that my idea of starting boys a year later in the same schools is radical, mm. just think for a moment what it would take to divide the entire US public education system up into girls and boys schools. And so, and so if, if, we're only, if we're only talking about people at the margins, people in private schools, a few charter schools, fine. But I'm, I'm more interested in uh, reforms that can help you know, the, the majority of students, not the handful. And there, and there I just don't see strong enough evidence. Maybe within school, a little bit of class. I don't. I don't even see much evidence there, honestly. And I don't think it's great that great preparation for life. So, uh, on on the whole, I'm 
you know, I'd, I'm not against it, but I'd certainly you're not going to put any political or financial capital behind it in terms of public policy. So to transition from education now to then how that trickles into the labor market, what are you noticing with, with young men in the labor market? Well, interestingly, the I mean, there's been a general drop in labor force participation, about eight percentage points in recent decades for men. Um, actually, the biggest drop has been among 25 to 34 year olds in, in the last two or three decades um, from different bases. It's important to say. Um, but the changes and here I'm referring to work by Catherine Abraham and Melissa Carney, uh, who are Maryland economists who've done a very good work on um, trends in what what's what's the jargon is EPOP employment, uh, the employment to population ratio, which is a, just a, a very good stable measure um, of just like how many of these people are there and how many are in employment. And so it's blind to why or not in employment is just what's the EPOP. And there they do see that younger men have uh, seen this decline. Uh, it's actually leveled out for women too, labor force participation. But the big story here is a class story. I mean, men with college degrees or decent levels of education or who get into a decent profession, they're doing pretty well. Their, their employment rates are still pretty good. They, they haven't declined anything like as much. It's men with lower levels of education or from poorer backgrounds that you're seeing cratering. So of men with a high school degree, a third of them are out of the labor market. That's about 10 million men. So wow. one in three chance of not being in the labor market if you've only got a high school diploma. So th these are huge numbers um, uh, for all kinds of different reasons, lots on disability, obviously there's the opioid crisis, uh, a huge number of them do take pain meds. Um, so it's a whole thing. Uh, in terms of understanding the causes, but it's working class men uh, and then black men, of course, disproportionate risk of incarceration. They do face discrimination in the labor market. So their labor force participation rates are lower. And in fact, among black Americans, there are f there are slightly more women in the labor force than men, which is the only racial group for whom that's true of. So you've got to look at it in different through different through a kind of class lens and a race lens. But when you do that, you see that there are some men who are being increasingly benched by the modern economy. Maybe back to the, the zero sum idea again. So if we have fewer men in the workplace, then perhaps that's more positions for women. And so maybe people don't necessarily see this as a problem. What, what would make the, the decline of men in the workforce a problem? Well, it's a problem for them just in terms of labor force participation being the main way you get income. Right? So just in terms of like economic independence, economic flourishing. I think the, the central insight of post-war feminism was economic independence. So get educated, get a job, make sure you can stand on your own two feet, make marriage a choice, not a necessity to use Gloria Steinem's phrase. The same is true of men. Right? If you want to be economically independent, if you want to be able to kind of go your way in the world, uh, then it's you need income of one kind or another. Um, uh, and men, especially if they don't have children, then they're not going to get any income from the state. So they're only, the, the, the labor market's where the labor market's where the money is. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And then, of course, number two, if they want to form families and share the economic responsibilities of raising children, being having a strong position in the labor market um, will will hugely help. Um, and what's most troubling, and here I'm thinking of work by Nicholas Eberstadt at the American Enterprise Institute and others too, is that a lot of the men who are out of the labor market, it's not clear what they're doing. So I want to be clear, it would be a very, very different world if the reason why men weren't in the labor market is because they were home raising the kids. But they're not. Um, it's actually slightly murky. They're trying to figure out what they're doing. They're very, quite unlikely to be living with the mothers of their children quite often, sometimes quite attenuated relationships with their children. They're not very involved in community life, etc. cetera. Um, as I mentioned before, big problems with disability, opioid addiction, alcohol, et cetera. So um, there, there's this kind of sense of what are they doing? And generally speaking, um, they're in trouble. They're, mm. they're, they're floundering, right? It's not, it's not, they haven't replaced work with another productive activity. It's basically just, there's this big vacuum there. And that's what I think one of the reasons why men account for three times as many of the deaths of despair as women. That's suicide, alcohol, or drug overdoses. Uh, th uh, three quarters of the opioid deaths uh, are male. Um, obviously, suicides three or four times higher among men um, than women, and falling. So, whereas homicide rates are declining quite steeply, it, suicide rates are going up quite sharply. And I think a lot of that is just about this sense of being kind of benched, of kind of being redundant, not just redundant in the economic sense, but redundant more generally. And that turns out to be incredibly bad for men's health and well-being. So those are the reasons why we should worry about it. Not just the, of course, it's bad for the economy and it's bad for women because it means they're having to do more and more of everything. But it's also just bad for the men themselves. What, what is that uh, redundant more generally? What, what do you mean by that? 
Well, so there's a phrase, maybe an Anglo-American thing, but so to be made redundant is a, uh, is a, to um, lose your job, right? So there's an economic definition of redundant. But, I, but I'm broadening that to say, just like, what are you needed for? What is your, what are you contributing to? Who's relying on you? And, and one thing, I'm probably more certain of this than almost anything else in my life, which is people need to be needed. We all need to be needed. Yes. Now, the nature of that needed can change, right? Needed by whom? Our kids, our wife, our family, our church, our, you know, parents. But uh, if you start to feel like you're not needed, if you start to feel like, well, the labor market doesn't seem to need me and my family doesn't seem to need me and my community, if I'm not needed, then I think that sense of, that's what I mean by redundant, is that you're just like, what's, what's the value of you? And I was very struck doing the work for this book by a study that Fiona Shand and her colleagues did where they looked at the words that men use to describe themselves before suicide. And the two words that they most commonly use to describe themselves before suicide were useless and worthless. Uh, and it seems to me that if you have a situation where people feel like they don't know what their use is or their worth is in the world, then the high suicide rates should uh, surprise us by how low they are rather than by high they, how high they are. And I think that gets to this you know, really deep cultural question, which is particularly for men with less with limited economic power. They're in, a, they're in a labor market that's really tough. We've transformed the relationships in the family so that women are now economically independent. The, the traditional roles and rites of passage and so on of men have you know, fallen away for some very good reasons but not being replaced, that means there are so many men, boys and men, who are really, really struggling. Um, and it's high time that we looked that fact in the face because otherwise you see the kinds of trage tragedies that I've just referred to. Mm -hmm. Richard, with this, this issue going on, um, what do you think uh, could be some, some good things to, to address this issue? Well, we've touched on a few already on the kind of in the policy wonky space, mm -hmm. right? So a huge investment in getting more men into our schools, giving boys extra time and the and the work that we've talked about getting more men into some of these more you know, these caring professions. We had a huge effort to get women into STEM um, and women into male professions, which has been great and very successful. We need to get more men into the growing professions in those heel sectors in health and education and so on too and they might be slightly different jobs on average to the kinds of ones that women are doing in those sectors but in those sectors more generally and really focusing on fatherhood i just i i think that the the central social importance of responsible and engaged fatherhood is something that's been somewhat lost between the reluctance on the political left to recognize that dads matter as dads for fear of offending you know, various people on the left, wrongly, wrongly in my view. And the right's obsession with like traditional marriage has left this huge space, which is just like whatever else, if you have kids, you're a dad. And if, you have, if you're a dad, you matter. You're not worthless, you're not useless. You're absolutely essential to the well-being of your kids, especially your sons. And so more paid leave for dads, better treatment of unmarried fathers. And more, and more just, a, I guess the last thing I'll say is just a, a a cultural conversation about this issue, which allows us to come back where, back where we started uh, at the beginning of this conversation, Brendan, that we can think two thoughts at once. We all want our daughters to flourish every bit as much as our sons. And we want our sons to flourish every bit as much as our daughters. And we all are in this new world of much greater and uh, much greater equality. But we should pay much closer attention to what's happening to our boys and men um, uh, just on the basis of, of being in favor of human flourishing and avoid pathologizing the problems that boys and men are having. We need a, we need a lot fewer pointing fingers and a lot more helping hands hmm. in this space as much as in others. Well, Richard, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people look for you online? So the, it's Richard V. Reeves. The V is very important. It's <laughs> Vaughan, my Welsh middle name, come down to my family. Um, uh, so that's important. So it's richardvreeves.com. I have a substack called of boys and men and i'm richard v reeves on twitter and of course the boy the book is called of boys and men and that's uh, that's uh, all bookshops good and bad <laughs> great we'll put links to that in the description for everyone to check out thank you and uh, richard my final question is for those who are leading or teaching or parenting young men um what do you think is is something that they can do right now to help those young men show them genuine compassion <laughs> 
for the difficulties they're having. Open your ears to the struggles that they're having as boys and men. Don't make them feel apologetic for the fact that they have diff some different issues, different feelings, different struggles to girls and women, and that there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing toxic about that. Uh, don't shut it down if, if they are watching videos or reading things that make you uncomfortable, that make you nervous maybe because they seem quite out there for you. I'm thinking about people like Andrew Tate, which if mm. you don't know who he is, please don't Google him. <laughs> um, he's had enough Google searches already, but I miss an, an, an online, you know, very you know, interesting messenger in many ways. Don't roll your eyes ever at anything your boys and men say. Listen to them um, and, and help them through it because this is a difficult time in some ways to be negotiating. So I've raised three boys in an affluent, very well educated, incredibly privileged background, but still. Actually, these are these are you know these are turbulent waters we're in right now in terms of gender relations, roles, etc. And we've done a really bad job of just listening. And what you're, what I'm discovering is that as you look around, there's a there's just this huge appetite to be heard and to be able to speak candidly about the problems that that, that boys and men are having. So open it up. Don't just ask once, "Are you okay?" Because you'll get yeah, fine. <laughs> you always have to ask twice. You probably have to be shoulder to shoulder video gaming or fishing or driving or something don't look them face don't look them face to face go shoulder to shoulder how's it going no really how's it going um and make yourself available to them and don't rule any topic out of question and even if something they say makes you think oh i'm not sure about that just breathe shut up and let them listen because if you don't listen to them somebody else will well, Richard, thank you for taking the time to have this discussion and for using your skills to um, generate this, this candid discussion about this topic. Um, it's obviously very important. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate you saying that, Brendan. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for watching this episode. To help get more great guests on the show, be sure to subscribe.